what we're going to go over, first of all, is what you need to know about your federal taxes uh, with, uh, being a small business owner. And um, we're going to cover things like uh, an EIN number, uh, record keeping, um, things that you can do to prevent missing deductible expenses uh, and, and income. Uh, making sure you count what is and is not income because all money you receive is not income. So, you know, that's like kind of the first uh, battle you may have or the first hurdle to get over with the IRS um, is counting income. Um, and we're going to talk about explaining items on your tax return. Um, and dealing with the statute of limitations. Uh, types of bookkeeping and record keeping. Um, we'll deal with uh, employees, classifying employees as contractors or uh, em actual employees, what it takes to do that and how you should properly classify them and also uh, some of the ramifications uh, for misclassifying someone. Uh, that is a really hot, actually it's a really hot topic right now because um, the IRS has known for years uh, that people, it's, it's common knowledge that people will try to classify someone as an independent contractor to avoid payroll taxes. And, um, and, that's, it's, and they have been putting more resources into uncovering uh, those practices. And I'll let you know what, some reasons why you might not want to take that risk. Um, we'll also talk about your responsibilities as an employer to your employees and uh, making sure that uh, you properly withhold the amount of taxes that you're supposed to and that uh, you remit those accordingly and the, the proper documents to file for them. And in the, in the second half, we'll, we'll discuss uh, home-based businesses. Um, I, don't, I don't know if anyone uh, operates an office out of the home, uh, but that is uh, it's very, um, you know, it, it's not really that complicated, but there, there are really uh, strict guidelines for operating your business out of your home. So uh, we will deal with that also. Okay, first, um, as a uh, federal, uh, you have to get a federal employer identification number. Uh, that's also been called your tax ID number. That was the, you know, uh, term that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, it's like the social security number for your business. You know, it, it helps separate you as an individual from your business. Um, however, that is not the only thing that separates you uh, from your business. Um, there's a lot of confusion on how you know you file in in, in the state. Uh, for instance, um, you know you have you have your state level and then you have your federal level. Okay, on, on your state level, that's when you choose what type of entity you want to be. Whether you want to be an LLC, a sole proprietor, that's just you doing business. Okay, anybody who conducts a garage sale, you're a sole proprietor. Okay. You don't have to do anything to be a sole proprietor. Um, to be an LLC, you have to file the proper documents with the state. Same thing with um, incorporating as a, as a, a regular C-level corporation. Um, those documents you file with the Secretary of State, and that governs your specific entity, okay, that you are. Now, and the state controls that and each corporation, no matter how big or whatever, is incorporated uh, in some state somewhere. A lot of them choose De Delaware because of the um, corporation laws. They're very developed there. But the federal level, the only thing you're dealing with on the federal level is um, how you choose to be taxed, okay? Now, your EIN number, when you fill that out, it has a lot of questions. Uh, it's, it's an SS4 form. It has a lot of questions on there about how you want to be taxed. And um, as an LLC, um, the default entry, uh, what, what the IRS chooses for you, 
is a, um, a basically a disregarded entity if, you only, if you're only one person. And that means that even though you have an EIN or whatever, um, that the income just flows through to you to your personal tax return on a Schedule C. Now, if you have a partner, um, your default is going to be, uh, the federal government is going to classify you as a partnership. And that means you have to file a, a, a Form 1065 when you get ready to file your tax return. And, um, and so that's the default uh, choice for a person with a partner. Okay, even if you're an LLC, uh, you can still, you can, you can be taxed that way. But to be taxed as a corporation, you actually have to elect to be taxed as a corporation. And that's the beauty of an LLC. That's why people like the LLC, because you get choices. And your choices uh, to be taxed, uh, that's what you're doing at the federal level. And that's what you're doing uh, when you um, fill out your EIN form. And it, and it seems very simple a lot of the times. but. Um, and you can do it yourself. You know, I'm not here to push professional services on you, but when you're trying to plan out how you want to be taxed and, and taking advantage of all the, the different tax laws, um, that's, that's when it's best to engage a professional because this is the point where you're choosing to do those things. And um, so your EIN number allows you, um, you know, to pay wages to employees. Uh, you can have a self-employment retirement plan. Um, again, you can operate your business as a corporation or a partnership. Uh, even as an individual, you can be a one-person corporation if you, if you so choose to do so. J.D., what, what uh, form did you say that if you're an LLC partnership that you fill out? Uh, it's a 1065 when you, when you file your return. And in fact, those are due today for, uh, <laughs> for uh, you know, for partnerships and subchapter S corporations and regular corporations, the due date is um, for the past tax year 2011. They're due today. And, um, and once you fill that out, you know, all the partners, they get what's called a K-1 schedule, and it goes on your personal tax return. Um, now, uh, you want your EIN number because um, when you go and you have to use your, that EIN number to do all these different things, you don't really want your social security number on all these different things for your different employees and whatnot. Um, so that's another reason to get an EIN number, okay? Um, let's see. Okay. Okay, now um, let's talk about uh, record keeping. Now, uh, record keeping is very important, of course, and um, these are the items that you need to keep. And typically, uh, you need to keep these items for uh, three to five years after you file your tax return, okay? Because once you file your tax return, and that's a, that's a great reason for filing your tax return. And I know some people like to wait, you know, for two years or three years uh, before you actually file it. But the reason that you want to file it is, is that it starts the statute of limitations running, okay, on the IRS. And they have a three-year statute of limitations to come and audit you, all right? So once you file that tax return, it starts running. When you don't file, it's open, okay? If you have any unfiled tax returns, those years are open for audit. So it protects you to file your tax return, okay, in a way. Uh, the only way that they can get past the three-year uh, statute of limitations is to prove that you misstated your income by more than 25%. It's kind of difficult to do. Or prove some type of fraud, all right? So, um, and that way they can open up your uh, closed tax returns. But other than that, you should keep your, um, 
your records for three to five years. The reason I say five years is because sometimes there are other issues with your employees that you may have to keep your records for longer than three years, okay? Now, um, <clears throat> your, good, your records and under audit, that's the thing that comes into play the most is your record keeping. Um, your records are gonna prove you know, your income, they're gonna prove your expenses, and um, not only do you have to keep the records, but you have to uh, make sure that you just don't have a, a shoebox full of receipts. That's not good enough. You know, you need uh, to actually categorize them and to have explanations of why you spent or used that particular expense because expenses are, number one, under the law, they have to be ordinary to your particular business and necessary. Ordinary and necessary. Okay. Um, now, what's ordinary and necessary to the salon owner may not be ordinary and necessary to the construction worker. Okay, so though it, it depends on the particular facts of your business, and um, so that gives a lot of flexibility. All right, to your particular business. Okay. Okay. These are three reasons that uh, good record keeping helps you. It, it helps the prevent you to uh, uh, it helps to prevent omission of deductible expenses. Okay. Now, uh, when you spent money on, I don't know, um, a uh, say you 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 bought a new iPad. Okay and you forgot about, you know, you, you bought it in, say, you buy one next week with a new one comes out. And then comes tax time uh, this time next year, um, you know, you're using it for business mostly. You may be using, you know, the kids may get a hold to it every now and then or whatever. But if you don't keep, you know, that, that particular record, you may forget about it, that I actually use this, you know, for business or you don't have that particular record, you've missed out on a, on a uh, 700 some odd dollar deduction. And so you wanna keep those records to, pre to pre prevent the omission of deductible expenses. Yes, ma'am. A lot of times you purchase things online, you only get electronic receipts. Can you just print that and save it? Or do you have to have some kind of a, um, a receipt from your vendor? Um, the online receipt will work. Okay, it, yes. Could you repeat the question, sir? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question was, is an online receipt, is that, um, will that be justification or sufficient as a receipt, or do I have, do, uh, does she have to get one from the, from actually from the vendor? So, um, the online receipt typically will have everything on it that you need. It will have, you know, the vendor name, it'll have the amount, and it'll have the, the, the item. You know, it, it needs to have those things, what, what the item actually was that you spend money on. Um, and to cl clear up a misconception, like a receipt, sometimes the, the, the IRS can be, depending on the auditor, because you have, you know, these are people, so you have some people that are a little more relaxed, you have some people that are a little more uptight. So some of them, they could actually say, well, I don't want to see any receipts. I want to see the actual, your actual expense. So you're going to have to show them either a cancel check, your credit card receipt, or your bank statement where it actually went out of your account. Because, I mean, I mean if you think about it, a person could go down to Home Depot and go through the trash can and get a bunch of receipts from Home Depot. Say, here, you know, these are all, I spent all this money as I have receipts. But that's not um, that's not sufficient. So it's not it's not very, that reliable. Okay. So some will accept receipts, but some will say, "Hey, I want to see you actually spent the money." Okay. So and that's why uh, a tip that I give to a lot of my clients is that when you start your business, just go ahead and get your separate bank account. With uh, there's a bunch of different banks that give you free checking, free business checking. Spend take. Take your debit card 
And every time you have a, a, a business expense, use your debit card. Because at the end of the month, you get your statement. It has all of your expenses right there on the statement. There's no keeping up with a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, a trash bag full of receipts or anything like that. It's very simple. It's very clean. And it shows that you actually spent the money. Okay, it actually came out of your account. And so that is the best evidence of an expense. Now, uh, now, I have a question, uh, yes. You mentioned something like somebody going and digging out of a trash uh, receipt. Now, if if there is like my employees using cash and uh, and it says cash, like paying cash, and you know I give them money, they bring me a receipt, I give them their money back then I recorded, you know, that this is the receipt and came out of the little drawer, you know, little cash drawer. That should be also good, isn't it? There shouldn't be any question about it. Well. Well. Uh, <laughs> really, I was pretty sure they should be any No, it, it can be questioned. I mean, you're, you're doing a, a decent job. And again, it depends on the discretion of the examiner looking what at. Would it be questioning? When there's a receipt and I, employee brought it to me refining he bought oil for a truck mm -hmm. you know three dollars for a can you know mm -hmm. he, bring, mm -hmm. he bought it for my truck so I have to give him his money back it's a expense right so how come I you know, I have a receipt how come you think it depends I mean it's a very clear transaction to me I use a cash instead of the credit card or check well, How come it could be questionable? I mean, why? Well, the, the, the reason it could be questionable is because, like I said before, they want to see that you spent the money, okay? Just because you have a receipt saying, you know, um, uh, there's a, say, a, a AutoZone receipt saying five quarts of oil, oil for X amount of dollars and, you know, the cash, it doesn't have your name on it. It doesn't have... Uh, you know, your company name on it, there, there's really, it, it, it can be questioned, okay? I'm not saying that every single auditor would do this, but some have, and it, and it has happened, and some have not. Some will take your word for it, you know what I mean? So it just depends on who you have. And so what I'm, what I'm trying to get across to you is to try to protect yourself as much as possible. Now, um, now, just because they, say, say you got a, an uptight auditor who disallowed that said hey you know it, it didn't work well what would help you is to have um, maybe a, a, a transaction log where um, when you have someone come in with a receipt make them have an expense report okay fill out a sheet of paper that says I such and such spent this amount of money you know uh, you can you can do one very easily on Excel I spent this amount of money on this date and have them sign it and give it to you, okay? And so that, that helps to substantiate that this particular person spent the money and I reimbursed them, okay? Yes, ma'am. Is part of the reason of not being able to show a statement that shows the withdrawal that people could say they purchased something with cash and then take it back? How could they, would be, they wouldn't be making money on that, though, would they? Well, Okay, the question was, um, the first question was, why wouldn't a receipt, um, a cash receipt, be, be deemed adequate by the IRS? And then the second question was, um, is part of the reason for, not, for the IRS not accepting cash, would that be because of fraud or uh, the person being able to take back the item? Um, and the answer to the second question is that that is part of the problem is that when when there are no names on receipts and their cash um, they can be passed around from person to person I mean it's 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 unreliable okay uh, it, it's reliable to a certain extent you know but it, there is the opportunity there for fraud and so the best evidence would be to show that it came out of your account that you actually spent the money, it came from a check that you had written, or um, uh, or that it came, you know, out of your account from a debit card or your credit card. 
that kind of thing. So, yes, sir. But if you've got a designated petty cash account, you know, you keep a little box in your desk, mm -hmm. and they bring that in, and you pay them out of petty cash, they sign a, you know, receipt that says John Q. Ref or return money for buying a quart of oil. Mm -hmm. And that petty cash box has to be reconciled. You know, when it runs out of money, then you've got to reconcile it before you can put money back in. That would be a valid proof that the money was spent because it's a petty cash fund. <coughs> okay, uh, the question was um, if a person is paid out of petty cash and the petty cash uh, account is reconciled, um, is that adequate proof of the expense? Um, again, yes and no. Okay, uh, it, it would help to have uh, the person to actually spend, uh, fill out an expense report and to sign it saying what they spent the money on and when they spent the money and um, and then it would be up to you to determine if that was you know if you had some type of guidelines or something to say whether or not it was ordinary and necessary expense to your business okay so that's the kind of analysis that the the auditor is going to go through all right now uh, now it, it, you know um, you're on the right track and that's better than a lot of people, you know. And so uh, I would say 75% of the time, that's going to be good enough. Um, but there are times and there are, you know, uh, very strict auditors that, that may not accept that, you know what I'm saying? So, um, and so it would help to have uh, that type of documentation because let, let me tell you what, I'll get to you in just a moment. Let me tell you what happens after. Um, uh, you meet with the auditor, okay? Say he disallows all that stuff and say, hey, you know, you, we're not accepting any of that. You owe us 10 grand. And so um, what happens after that is that you appeal it. You know, you, you talk to a professional like myself and we appeal that within the IRS. And the appeals officer is, is supposed to take a fresh look at the situation and see if maybe the, the other auditor was being unreasonable. Uh, well, the problem with that is, is that the first auditor is like a judge, okay? Their determination is their determination. And the, the appeals officer is pretty much going to, um, he, he's not going to rubber stamp it, but he's going to say, well, you know, they, they took the time to look through everything and um, we're going to determine whether they were reasonable or not. And say that, and say, and, and you're going to have to, come with more evidence and so by you having extra records about who spent that money and whatnot you know those are witnesses okay that you can go back to and say you know we did this and you know this transaction actually happened okay and say the appeals officer still says nah you know our examiner was right he, you know we're not going to accept it you still owe us you know 10 grand now it's about uh, 10-5 with interest and penalty, you know. And so uh, now uh, you have the option to appeal to uh, the U.S. tax court and to have a judge take a look at it. And so, um, again, that's when your witnesses and whatnot and all that stuff comes into play. And I'd say 95% of people will never even get to that, to that point, all right? But... Um, um, I'm just, you know, letting you know that that is the reason behind having, you know, all this, you know, extra uh, documentation, so to speak. It, it's going to help you in the long run, okay? Yes, ma'am, did you have a question? So would it be better then if you have employees that spend their own money and they bring you the receipts, would it be better to reimburse them on their payroll? Oh, absolutely not. Well, I mean, if you can't re reimburse them out of the petty cash without having all the hanging over your head that you may unfortunately get one of these strict uh, auditors, then how do you show that you're that they spent it for the company and you're reimbursing it and it's coming out of an account base? Because that's what you said. You wanted something that shows that it comes out of an account 
Well, if you add it to their payroll, well, as a reimbursement, then it shows it's coming out of your account. Just writing a check. Absolutely, right. That's a. But it's the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah, it keeps it separate from your pay. Uh, the the question was uh, whether or not um, expense reimbursements to employees should be included on their paycheck, and uh, my answer to that is no. You know, I I would find another way to do it because you're you're mixing up. Uh, items, even though you could have an, an, a line item saying, you know, reimbursement. Yeah, most uh, allows us to do that. Yeah, um, I, I would just would avoid doing that because it confuses, uh, it confuses the different amounts. Okay, um, either you could, you could you could write them a check, you could pay for it yourself, you could have uh, a maybe a, a, a separate account where you give your you actually give your employees a, 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 a debit card to that particular account maybe the account only has 50 bucks in it you know what I mean for like a petty cash account okay and it only has 50 bucks in it, and they can they can go ahead and, and pay for it and uh, that way you get the statements and everything like that okay um, but I, I would just avoid um, I would try as much as I could to avoid cash transactions for expenses. Now, there are other things that you may want to do cash transactions for, but you know, I'm not going to get into that. But you, you for, but for expenses that you're trying to prove uh, to someone, uh, the IRS or whoever else that wants to look at the expenses, I would have a definite, a really good paper trail showing that it went out of my bank account. Uh, because the bank account helps because it's a third party there's less um, opportunity for fraud because the bank has no interest in lying about your expenses or anything like that, but the auditor believes you have every uh, interest and every uh, motivation to inflate your expenses. And that's really how they're, they're, their first approach to you, that, that is what it is, you know, that, that's how they feel, you know, and, and they, they've seen so much and whatnot, there, and, and you know, not, not to disparage, uh, you know, auditors, but they're basically very skeptical. So I would just uh, do what I could do, uh, do my very best to make sure that I am, uh, I have a paper trail on all of my records. And, um, and your records, not only, we spent a lot of time on, on expenses, but your records as far as um, your income, uh, it helps also because, uh, say for instance, uh, you got a business loan and there's you know, uh, money that came into your account or you have a line of credit. Well, a loan or a line of credit, that is not income, okay? It's a loan, all right? And so you have to keep very good records of that because uh, you shouldn't include that as income. And so all of a sudden, you know, uh, if you don't, if you're not keeping good records on what is and is not income, or maybe you loan some somebody money and they paid you back, that's not income. Okay, uh, so you need to keep very good records of those things because, you know, you could you could have you could be overstating your income, which would cause you to pay more tax, which you you know you shouldn't do. What what you don't want to do, I should say. <laughs> Um, and again, uh, we did talk about explaining items on your, on your income tax return under audit. Um, <clears throat> this particular publication, I believe you have one in your packet, um, it talks about record keeping and, um, you know, starting and, and keeping business records. It's a, it's a very good publication and I, I definitely recommend it. And the good thing about publications is that um, this is actually a, a position that the IRS has taken. And if you rely on this particular publication and you follow it, you know, they, they can't say, you know, um, no, that's wrong or you didn't do the right thing. Th this is basically your, um, <laughs> yeah, so, so to speak, it's your Bible that you can go by. 
Okay. Um, again, how long uh, should the records be kept? Uh, we talked about that three years after the tax return is due or filed or two years from the date the tax is paid, whichever is later. Um, and my statement is three to five years. Okay. Uh, and, and to explain the first one, three years after the tax return is due or filed, whichever is later. That's very key. Okay, say I, I file my personal tax return today. Okay, today's uh, March 15th. It's really not due until April 17th this particular year. All right, and so just because I filed it today, that doesn't start the statute of limitations running. It, it, it expires three years from uh, April 17th. Okay, that's the date it's due because that's the later date. Now, say I file an extension and I don't file it until uh, October. Well, that's the day that the statute of limitations starts running. All right, it's, it's gonna be three years from October. So it's, it's whichever is later, all right? And, um, or uh, two years from the date the tax is paid. So now, if you owe a bunch of money and you get on an installment plan and it takes you three years <laughs> to pay it off, well, it's still open. It's still going to be, uh, your tax year is still going to be open for two years after that date. Okay? So you would keep, you need to keep all the records related to that for that period of time. Okay, we just talked about that. It's kind of, it's kind of sensitive. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this is the employer's tax guide. Uh, it's publication 15. Uh, so, and that, I believe that's in your in your um, packet also. Uh, let's talk a little about a bit about bookkeeping systems. Um, you know, basically you have you know two types of bookkeeping systems. Uh, you have you know your cash basis and you have your accrual basis. Um, and the cash basis is usually your single entry. Uh, bookkeeping system. Um, again, it's, it's very simple. Uh, pretty much, you know, anybody can do it if you can uh, add and subtract. Um, and you can um, record a, a, a daily, monthly uh, summary there. And um, it, the single entry system is not, it's not a, a complete accounting system, but it, it gets the job done. And um, it shows, you know, your income and expenses and, you know, the uh, basic, basic detail. Um, and it, it works. I mean, it is acceptable. Uh, but the uh, double entry bookkeeping system, uh, uh, a lot of the uh, more complex companies use it uh, because it's more accurate. Uh, you have, when you have a double entry system, it has automatic checks and balances. And it's, uh, it's self-balancing. And it takes a little more training and uh, expertise to use the, the double entry bookkeeping system. Um, many of the software programs out there help, help with that a lot. Um, of course, I, I know everybody's pretty much familiar with uh, QuickBooks, and there are some other uh, programs out there that help you get through the, the double entry system. Are most of the automated systems double entry, like QuickBooks? I mean, is QuickBooks double entry? Yes. I mean, I, um, the question was, is QuickBooks uh, typically a double entry system? And uh, yes, it is. Uh, and, and, and there's a, uh, an option on there where you can choose uh, how you want to see your reports. Um, because typically, I mean, like for instance, um, in a double entry system, you're going to have two entries. When you, when you receive, say you make a sale, you're going um, to debit your cash account. Uh, that's an increase to your cash account. And on your sales account, you, you credit it. Okay. And so it's two entries there, and um, and so it's 
self-balancing because you have um, two entries and, and everything has to match up. Uh, your, your debits are going to equal your credits um, when you run a, what's called a trial balance. And that's usually what I prepare tax returns from as a, tri as a trial balance, which you know, is going to show you know, what your assets are, what your liabilities are, and then all of your expenses. And, um, and it should balance out. Okay. Um, again, this is just going over that again. A cash method is typically you know, your single entry system. The accrual method is uh, your double entry system. Um, you know, and on your tax return, you have to use the same method that you use to uh, use for your bookkeeping. And uh, you know, under the cash method, uh, you report all the income in the year you receive it, and all expenses in the year that you paid it. Uh, under the uh, under the accrual uh, system, there could be some timing differences. Um, for instance, say, uh, you know, say you have an insurance payment that's due, um, and you could, uh, in, a, in the accrual system, you know, you would have a liability for insurance payable, and then um, you may not have actually written the check yet, you know, until the next year or to, uh, you know, January 1st or whatever. And so, but it still counts for uh, December for the, for the prior year. But under the cash method, it doesn't count until you actually spend it or you actually receive the, the money. Uh, and uh, that last point is very important. Uh, if you have inventory for sale, uh, usually, uh, you know, the accrual method is going to work a lot better for you to keep track of in inventory and, and sales and receivables. Okay. N uh, any questions about what we've discussed so far? Uh, so now we're going to get into uh, what you need to know about your taxes when, when, when hiring employees. Okay. Um, what we're going to talk about here is first is identifying an employee versus an independent contractor. Uh, we're going to discuss your responsibilities as an employer and identify payer related forms. Um, we're going to uh, verify, talk about how to verify employee information with the Social Security Administration and explain the purpose of the uh, the new hire registry, uh, and then there will be some items about filing the proper forms online. Okay, uh, when you're an employer and you're withholding taxes, uh, FICA, uh, FUTA, Social Security, Medicare, those are called trust fund taxes, okay? And you are in a very uh, responsible fiduciary uh, you have a fiduciary responsibility, okay? Because uh, your employee is expecting you to withhold and pay the proper amount when they filled out their, their W form based on what they filled out. Now, if you, if you do not do that, um, the liability can fall back on you as an employer and not on the employee. Uh, trust fund taxes are, ve are very peculiar where, you know, I know, you know, you hear about the, the commercials and the stories about people who have owed, owed the IRS $100,000 and then they get to settle it for 10000 or whatever. Um, that does not happen with everyone. Uh, first, it depends on your individual circumstances. Um, now, a 75-year-old woman who is drawing Social Security and has a limited income and, and she gets hit with a tax bill for $100,000, yeah, they might settle it for pennies on the dollar. But if you're, um, you know, 35 years old, you have a bunch of assets, you have a, a, a nice income, that's not going to happen to you, okay? You're, you're, it's not going to settle. 
But in any event, no matter how old you are or what your circumstances are, if you withheld money from someone else and you didn't pay it, they look at that as like theft. Okay, you basically withheld the money and you didn't pay it. There is no way that's ever going to get settled. Okay, so it's very important that you uh, be mindful of your responsibilities as an employer. Right. Yes. Um, I work with entrepreneurs doing consulting here at Francis Tuttle. And what if you have uh, someone who who didn't withhold them, but just paid the employees a flat amount? What ha what happens then? Okay. Because when you do your W-2 for that employee, there's not going to be any withholding amount unless, right? Right. The question That's is, come up. <laughs> okay, the question is, uh, what happens when a person or when an employer did not withhold the proper amounts from their employee? Right. Okay. Um, well, the employer is going to be on the hook for that amount of taxes. Not only because uh, there's an amount that the employee pays uh, their half of their taxes, what you withhold, and then there's an amount that the employer pays on behalf of the employee for having that employee. Well, the employer is going to res be responsible for all of it, okay, in the end. Uh, because the employee, the employee had uh, an expectation that the amount was going to be withheld properly according to his W-4 form that he filled out, the number of dependencies claiming, uh, and his filing status. You know, uh, whenever you know you get your, whenever you uh, start your job, you know you fill out that form. You know, you put the one or the zero or whatever you put down, um, and so based on that is how the employer is going to calculate your withholding. All right. And uh, when they don't do that, and say, say you know, say for instance, the, the uh, employee uh, put down zeros or said he was tax exempt on his uh, W-4, well, um, you, the employer still has a responsibility to, to do a minimal amount of withholding, okay? And if the employer does not do that, the employer is going to be on the hook for the employee's portion and their portion, okay? So... And there's, uh, of course, going to be penalty and interest associated with that amount. So I'm sorry. So there is a, I haven't been in a situation like that, but you're telling me that somebody come in my office, my new employee, and tell me, no, I'm to tax that deductible. You should not be taking any taxes out of my paycheck. Is there a situation like that? Am I gonna, can I face it something like that? And then I say, no, 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 I have to, you have to pay it, and I have to match it. So there's, you know, people might try, you know, mm -hmm. but so, so there is no situation like that. I cannot be saying, oh, okay, well, you know what you're talking about. I guess I shouldn't be taking out your paycheck. You pay your taxes wherever you, it's, you know, your annual tax return. There is no situation like that. I always should have withhold the taxes. Yes, oh. uh, to be on the safe side. Now, uh, in the end, when they file their tax return, if they didn't make enough money, because some, sometimes, uh, for instance, say you have a part-time employee, and uh, for the entire year, if they're going to only going to uh, you know work 20 hours a week and they're or, or uh, 10 hours a week and they're at minimum wage, they might not even hit the um, the amount where you would have to withhold from them um, on say state income taxes or federal, okay? Um, but that's very rare, all right? Say it, because say the person is um, on salary for 10 hours a week and you know what they're gonna make for the entire year and you know that they're not gonna uh, hit the threshold where they even have to file, okay? Well, you're not gonna be on the hook for withholding uh, the, the tax amount, but, but the, um, but there could be some responsibility for the Social Security amount oh, yes. and yeah. whatnot. Because that's a percentage. Okay. So if you get a dollar, right. you pay the percentage of the dollar. Right. So that, that's really the only circumstance. But I would always err on the side of withholding because when they file their tax return, if they don't owe it, the IRS will pay it back to them as a tax refund. So I, I wouldn't even uh, get into that. I, I wouldn't take the risk as an employer, personally. 
Um, so, okay. Um, and, and that kind of leads us into the independent contractor versus an employee. And um, now, you don't have any withholding responsibilities when it comes to an independent contractor. And that's why a lot of people choose to misclassify a person that is actually an employee as an independent contractor. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the uh, criteria that you use to decide whether or not a person that you hire is an, is an independent contractor or an employee. And um, so uh, basically, the criteria and the decision process ba is based on a couple of items, uh, the right to control and the right to control uh, how the employee performs their work and, and what they do for you, okay? Um, and a person is your employee if you have, to have the right to control what is to be done and how it is to be done. Um, it is, it's not necessary for you to be standing over their shoulder and telling them, you know, exactly what to do, uh, A, B, C, one, two, three, but um, you only, if you have the right to do that, that's all that's necessary, okay? If you are providing uh, the cubicle, the computer, uh, all of their office supplies, you tell them what time to show up, you tell them what time to leave, it's starting to lean toward that this person is an employee. Now, independent contractor typically has their own business, okay? They do the same service not only for you, but they do it for other people, all right? Uh, they pretty much negotiate with you when they can come in to uh, do your plumbing or your uh, schedule this delivery or whatever, they gonna, whatever they're gonna do for you. Th they have some say-so on, on when they're gonna come and how it's gonna be done. Usually they have their own tools, okay? Uh, you're, you're not providing all the equipment for them, all right? Um, so those are some of the things that, that are looked at. And they bill you, right? Absolutely. Uh, they should bill you. Um, I, would, I, I would go so far, if they're an independent contractor, you want a contract, okay? This is how much you are to be paid, uh, and these are the items you know, that you are supposed to do. Um, the task that you're supposed to accomplish. Uh, did you have a question, ma'am? This is a huge debate in the trucking industry. Ah, I, I, it absolutely is. Um, and, um, but again, uh, there is a, um, uh, there are tests to go through to figure out whether or not someone is uh, an employee or an independent contractor. And um, again, um, it, it kind of hinges on the right to control, you know, behavior, financial, and the relationship of the parties. Um, for instance, for behavioral control, uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, does my business have the right to, to direct and control how the worker does the work I hired them to do? Okay, if you, if you specify how it's to be done in a, in a certain way, say for instance, uh, you know, something simple like, you know, building a fence. Well, um, do, do I control, um, you know, how they're gonna do it, what, what, what steps they're gonna do first, second and third, where they're gonna start, um, all those kind of things. I mean, you know, th th and, and that's just one factor because, I mean, I know as a, a bona fide independent contractor that's building a fence for me, I may have some legitimate business reasons that, you know, I need to know when they're uh, starting on the, the east side or the west side. I, I need to know that. I, I need to know whether or not concrete trucks are going to be coming in and out or whatever. I, there's some things that I'm going to need to control. So that's not the only factor. Then um, you have, um, you know, your financial uh, aspect of, uh, of, of, you know, whether or not a person is an employee or an independent contractor. For instance, if they have their own liability insurance, or do I pay their liability insurance? Um, do, uh, you know, do they pay their own expenses? Do I pay them on their behalf? 
you know, certain things like that. I mean, it, it, it starts to become clearer and clearer after you go through the analysis who is an employee and who is an independent contractor. Okay. And also, um, lastly, it's the, uh, uh, the relationship of the parties. Um, generally, a person, uh, again, who performs services for you is an employee. And, um, and whether you have, the, you know, the, again, the right to direct and control what they do. Um, now, typically, the IRS is going to err on the side of calling somebody an employee. If this dispute ever comes up with you and the IRS, they're going to err on the side of calling them an employee. So it's going to be incumbent on, upon you uh, to be able to show that this person is not an employee. This person is an independent contractor. And uh, again, it's best to uh, classify that person accurately and early on. Because what, ha what happens is, uh, as we were talking about before, it's the same situation. If you had an employee and you weren't doing the proper withholding, well, if you had, a, 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 you had classified someone as an independent contractor and they were truly an employee, and say you let this go on for a year, two years, okay, um, and then you get caught and the IRS reclassifies that person as an employee. Well, all of a sudden, uh, you're on the hook for two years' worth of employment taxes, interest, and penalty, and that can add up pretty fast to a, a large sum of money. Jimmy, can we talk about some of the gray areas of an independent contractor versus employee? Okay, sure. Um, like we've had issues come up of virtual assistants who do office work like making appointments, uh, doing documentation, picking up, you know, doing some personal assistant duties. Um, maybe they do social media uh, promotion for a business owner, mm -hmm. all under the umbrella of being a virtual assistant. Mm -hmm. I've been told that as long as they use their own equipment, and work out of their home, that they're not actually coming into the business to work certain hours, that they are independent contracts, uh, independent contractors. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, again, the question is uh, if a virtual assistant uh, who is in their own uh, office space and using their own equipment would be classified as an employee or an independent contractor. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is it depends. Okay, uh, so uh, now, again, going through the, the test, the, the, there's a, um, if, if you get on irs.gov, you have, you have what's called the IRS 22 factors, okay? And by the time you go through all of those factors, you should be able to determine whether that person is an independent contractor or an employee. And again, um, you're, con you're on the right track uh, to classify them as an independent contractor because number one, they do have their own office. They are, uh, they have their own equipment. But a, a key here is, is that person performing the same service for only you or for 10 other clients that they may have? Okay, if, okay, okay, so that, that would go a long way to show that this person is an independent contractor. Now. Later on in our session about a home office, uh, we're going to talk about uh, even when you have a home office, you can have an employee that, that has another office somewhere else and that you pay them and, and they don't have to come to your home to be considered a part of your business. That, that, uh, you know, that happens all the time. So, uh, so I'm saying that to say that just because a person has their own office does not mean that they're not an employee. So it's other items that come into play. Uh, again. Um, but if I have a construction company mm -hmm. and I work with an independent contractor who does framing <coughs> and I work with an independent contractor who does plumbing and another independent contractor who does electricity, but they only ever work for my company on different projects. Employee or 
Okay, let me repeat the question. Um, the question is, if I'm a, a general contractor right, in construction, construction. construction company, and I have contractors uh, who do different trades and they only work for me, um, uh, that, is, that is a gray area, and again, the answer is it depends. But in that particular case, um, the, that factor that they only work for you gets us toward leaning toward the employee side. <coughs> However, if those independent contractors have their own tools again, uh, they have their own liability insurance, they have their own bank accounts where they pay for uh, whatever expenses that they have, um, that's the financial aspect of it. Um, you know, if, if you offer them any type of retirement plan or any type of benefits, perks and whatnot, um, that's gonna, you're gonna lean toward the employee side. Uh, but again, if they're, if they're doing their own thing, um, they have their own uh, employees, they have their own uh, uh, benefit package, they have their own uh, bank accounts, they pay their own expenses, those kind of things. Now we're starting to lean more toward the uh, independent contractor side, all right? So, um, but again, uh, I just, just off the top of my head, that was about, you know, six to 10 different items, but there are actually 22 items, you know, that you go through, and it's, it's, it's pretty thorough. And uh, once you get done doing that analysis, you should have a pretty good idea of which one they are. Okay. okay. Where do You're we welcome. get the list of the 22 items? Because, like, for a trucking company, my driver, the tool to drive a, a, a dump truck, mm -hmm. is a Class A license. That's something they go out and they get on their own. You know, just like any construction company, I tell them where they need to, what job they need to go to, what time they need to be there. But, how, you know, it's my vehicle that they're taking, my truck that they're taking to the job site, but how they get there, how, you know, how they drive that truck, I can't tell them that. You know, I can tell them don't break anything, I can tell them don't run into anybody, but the control is in their hands. Well, uh, But if they're driving your truck and your insurance and using your insurance, mm -hmm. then I would think they would be your employee. That would be my interpretation. Other than it's an own truck. Yeah. Truck to you, yeah. yeah. And their own insurance. Oh, I've got, I've got the in, the independent contractors as well, as well. And even that's in up in the air as to whether they're comp ten ninety nines or not. So, and they have their own, they pay their all their own stuff. That's why I was. I mean, does the IRS have a booklet on defining? Yes. Um, it's uh. Let's see. The IRS.gov 22 factors? Yeah, you can get on IRS.gov and uh, they have a bunch of forms and publications. And um, let's see. I thought there was a. Well, we have the circular E employer's tax guide. Yeah. Okay. Um, that, I'm not sure if that has it in there. But, uh, but if you go to irs.gov and in the search portion, uh, type in uh, the IRS 22 factors or employee versus ver um, independent contractor and that it'll come up, okay? Uh, because there, there are, you know, a bunch of different items that they looked at. Like I said, you know, uh, relationship is gonna be, um, it's gonna be about three or four items under the relationship test. Uh, three or four under the control test, uh, three or four under the behavior uh, test, and, uh, and there is a bunch of other items in there. And by the time you get through it, you should have a, a pretty good idea. And, um, and if you want to talk more about your individual situation, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely available. And uh, you, know, you can contact me and we can talk about it and uh, help shore up your position. I just want to cover just briefly um, the, the items that as an employer, uh, some of the reports and forms that you will need to, uh, to cover. Um, of course, your W-4, we talked about that earlier. Um, that's the withholding certificate that the um, employee signs. And that's kind of, you know, it, it helps you, it helps safeguard you 
to say that, you know, this is what I was told by the employer. They told me to withhold at, um, you know, one or, or, you know, they put down, they had, you know, or, or, you know, they had 10 dependents or whatever, and that's what the rate I withheld at. And so that helps you, okay? And so, uh, and if it turns out that um, because you withheld at a, at a lower rate, uh, because of what they said on the, on the, on the uh, saying they had 10 dependents, and uh, again, like we talked about earlier, you're, you're obligated to withhold something, uh, that helps to show that, hey, you know, I did it based on uh, what they told me. Okay, uh, of course, this is your I-9 form, uh, eligibility for employment. Um, everyone has to fill this out. Uh, yes? On your here, I see exemptions from withholding. What would that be? What would be the case? What, what would be the exemption? What would the employee be telling me? Um, Oh, again, um, it would be, say for instance, um, uh, you had a, um, uh, maybe a, a student uh, intern, uh, something like that, uh, or um, again, that the, say the person you, you knew, like say they were gonna work a summer for you, and they were gonna make a maximum of like $3,000. And um, so, you know, based on that, they're not gonna have, uh, you know, if, if that was all the money that they made for that year, then they're not, they're not even going to meet the, uh, the threshold to even have to file, okay? So... Um, and that magic number is $3,000? No, the, the, uh, the magic number is about, for an individual, I think it's like ninety-seven fifty something like that, because, you, you know, for every person you have your personal exemption, and you have your standard deduction. And so those two amounts, if you don't, if you don't make more money than those two amounts, then your income is going to be zero, okay? And that's just as far as uh, income tax. Now, uh, you're still supposed to require to withhold for uh, Social Security and uh, Medicare. Th those are not, um, you're, you're not exempt uh, from that unless, um, Actually, the, the, you're not exempt for that until you, you hit a certain amount of money that you uh, earn over time. And then, you, you know, after $118,000, I believe, you're, you're not um, subject to Social Security tax anymore. You're only taxed on that first uh, 118000 Does okay. this also apply to the state tax, or they still have to pay a state tax? State tax? Um, oh, they could be exempt from that. They could be, you know, but the, but the amount is lower, okay? Um, like on the federal, you know, you have your personal exemption and your standard deduction, which uh, for an individual I think comes out to about um, 97.50, like I said. I think it's around that. But in, in under state, it's much lower. It's like... Um, I use these computer programs, so I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's a lot lower. You know, um, I, I want to say, um, I think it's under 5,000, you know, uh, just to be general. Uh, let's see. Um, Okay. Steve. Yes. On that, uh, if they say they're exempt, do they have to show me some kind of proof, or is it them putting down that they are exempt on the W-4 sufficient proof that say you know the IRS isn't going to come back and say, well, kid, you should have known this. Well, um, no, I, I wouldn't. The, the question was if, if a person marks exempt on the, uh, on the IRS W-4 form, uh, does that relieve you from your responsibility from withholding? And no, it doesn't. Um, there, if, if they are exempt, um, again, they would only be exempt from uh, the actual federal tax amount. Right. You still have to withhold for uh, the other payroll taxes like the Medicare and the Social Security taxes. No one's exempt from that. Okay, 
and and then again they're only exempt they would only be exempt from the federal tax if they fell under certain guidelines which would be again if they made a lesser amount of money than what it would take for them to actually have to file um, that would be in excess of their personal exemption and their standard deduction uh, which for an individual you know turns out to be it's around you know 97.50 or so um, and um, there is uh, so a, a person is, is not going to be uh, exempt and then even if they're um, a foreign worker or you know you you've you know needed an engineer from China or something like that I mean it, it would take you um, you'd have to go through some other steps to um, to ensure that you know that they were not um, an, an actual employee or that they were exempt from uh, you know federal income tax withholding and so um, just because they say they're exempt that that's not necessarily true okay well do you have to submit that to the IRS the W-4 to verify that they can claim that exemption okay we're, we're gonna go through that um, the exemption again uh, it would only be if if they qualified it would only be for the actual federal okay. income tax and then that's not their responsibility should they file their 1040 at the end of the year they didn't pay in enough I mean that's between the IRS and that individual correct like say right. for instance I've got a union worker who's making thirty dollars an hour mm -hmm. and I hire him for the whole year well he's gonna make more than the ninety seven hundred dollars mm -hmm. so I still didn't withhold any federal is that something that him and the IRS is gonna to have to deal with it's not gonna be the employers responsibility to say hey you're making more you're gonna to have to pay something in it's not our job to tell him to pay right as the uh, no it, it is your responsibility if they if you know that they're gonna make over a certain amount of money okay, you have to withhold I mean I guess that's where when they claim ex exempt on their W-4 we go ahead and you know show them having 20 uh, deductions so they don't pay any federal I mean what how is that the employer's responsibility to say hey no you have to pay something in um because uh yes it's going to fall on you and that's what you tell them is that you you would be ultimately responsible if you didn't withhold the minimum amount okay which which would be um it's it's basically if they if they say that they're exempt uh and you know that they're going to make more than uh the uh the threshold amount more than like you know 97.50 you were told at uh, the lowest rate, which would be a one, okay? It's a, yeah, single one, okay? And then um, let it go from there. And if they have, they have a problem with that, I mean, I, I would just tell them, I'm sorry, I have to withhold it. And if you are truly uh, exempt, you're gonna get a refund at the end of the year when you file your taxes. But that's, I guess, I mean, I've been in that situation mm -hmm. where, you know, like. I've had an employee that was making $30 an hour and they claimed exempt and I'm like, well, how are you exempt? And I was like, I wish I was, you know, <laughs> I still got to pay in. Mm -hmm. And he just said, well, I just am and you don't need to withhold any from my federal. So I didn't for that whole year and I still haven't been contacted by the IRS or anybody. Okay. I mean, you didn't withhold I did. anything? When I W-2, I mean, you know, when I do the W-2s at the end of the year, no, I didn't withhold anything. And I just submitted that to the IRS. I still haven't heard from anybody. I mean, yes, I've heard that 100% disabled vets are exempt from federal taxes, and some of them are still very employable. So maybe is, is that the kind of situation? Yeah, that could be a situation, but uh, they have to reestablish their exempt status every year. You know, like sometimes, you know, you fill out your W 4 and you worked on a job for five years and you never, you know, you never uh, changed it. Well, if someone's exempt, they need to reestablish that exempt. Do they have to paperwork, give you paperwork to say this is, the IRS says I'm exempt? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and so what you're saying is in case of the job saying you have to pay, he said I don't want to and I'm exempt, 
I can say, okay, you contact IRS, and if they send me a paperwork or if they send you paperwork stating you are exempt, you bring me the copy of it, then I will approve it. And the copy of the document should be sufficient. Is that what IRS would do? Would they actually give that person something saying, yes, you are exempt? Uh, yeah, like in the case of a 100% uh, disabled veteran, um, you know, some of them can work. They're not su supposed to be working. Uh, but again, um, the easiest thing for you to do, I would withhold at the single one rate, okay? And then let them, uh, if, if they want to fight about it or if, if they're truly uh, exempt or they, if they don't have to pay when they file their tax return, they will get a refund of that, of that amount of money. But um, me as an employer, I'm not going to take that chance or jump through the extra hoops. I mean, you know, you're an employee, uh, you're working for me. Um, if, if you're going to make more than uh, $10,000, I'm going to withhold at a single uh, one rate. And, and that's just. This also comes back to the deduction. Say they fill out the W-4 mm -hmm. and they say, okay, I got. 25 dependents. <laughs> yeah. You know? And then it usually, when you write the check, there's nothing there in, in the federal. Right. Is that my backup to say, hey? Absolutely. And that's, that's, that's why, off, yeah, that's why you need that W-4 form. Okay. So it's, I, you know, I can't come back to me and say, listen, this right. guy's claiming 25 deduct or Exactly. Kids. How do I know he doesn't have 25 kids? Right. And see, and, and again, that only affects their federal tax rate, but you're still responsible for Social Security oh, yeah, yeah, and Medicare. Exactly. You have to withhold. Federal, yeah. And and, and that, that's what normally the employers get in trouble on, is not with, when you withhold, don't withhold the proper amounts uh, for, you know, Social Security and Medicare, that's really where the employer, that what's the, what the IRS is concerned about. Mm -hmm. Now, if it, on, on the federal tax, and they've told you something bogus about, you know, their um, number of dependents and whatnot, as um, long as you have that W-4, yeah. You're, you're, you're fine, and you have pay, actually paid it in. <laughs> you know, you can't, you know, again, withhold it and do something else with the money. You know, you have to actually, you know, file those reports, um, 940, 941, send them in, and pay it. Okay. One more question. Yes, sir. Okay. You've got an employee that you say is going to work for the summer. He's not going to earn, in your estimation, more than 10000 Okay, end of the summer comes and he says, well, no, I, I, you know, if you can use me, I'd like to stay. Well, okay, he stays for the entire year. You know then that he's going to go over that $10,000 bracket, but for that period that you hired him for initially, you haven't withheld anything because it was, in your opinion, he was not going to. Now, do you have to go back at that point uh, at the end of the summer and say, well, we're going to have to start withholding taxes at a higher rate on you to cover the three months back here in the summer that you were working as a non-taxable employee. Absolutely. And the thing about that is, is that, um, and, and you said, you know, I have to qualify that by, uh, and, and, and the question was, uh, if a summer, a seasonal employee worked, um, you know, f they, you initially thought that they were going to work for a period of time, a short period of time, and, uh, and not meet the uh, filing requirements, and then they end up working more than that, uh, will you have to withhold at a higher rate to make up for that? Yes, you do. But at the same time, you said, uh, you know, you didn't withhold anything. And, and, um, there's no such thing as not withholding anything. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you have to, again, the uh, Social Security taxes and the Medicaid, Medicare, you have to withhold that under pretty much, you know, all circumstances, um, just to be on the safe side. I mean, there's a few, you know, very rare exceptions, but um, for everyone's purposes here, you know, I, I would just always uh, withhold at least at the uh, single one rate. So that would protect me as an employer, regardless. Yes, I mean it. it, it, it Absolutely, that, that's what I would say. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean that that W four uh, says. You know they're they're wanting one thing on that W four. If they had uh, 
filled out that W-4 and, um, and misrepresented what the true situation is on that W-4, but they, they signed it and they gave it to you, okay? Um, you, that, that safeguards you to a certain extent uh, as far as the federal tax withholding amount. But, the act, but again, uh, FICA, Medicare, Social Security, there, there, there's really no uh, reason that you shouldn't withhold that, okay? All right, um, moving on, okay, W nine, uh, the I-9 form, that's to show that the person is eligible to work in the United States. Um, you can verify social security numbers. Uh, is that document just signed for them to sign it and file it, or do I have to do something with that document, that I-9? No, you keep it. You keep it in your office. And that's it. Okay, and that, that's all you have to do. You have to actually follow up and make sure that this is real. Yes. Well, and, and we're going to get to that. You, you, uh, but you know, you, you keep you keep that form, and then uh, and then also, um, the, it's very important that the verification that you use. If if um, if you have a person that shows you a driver's license and a birth certificate or a passport, uh, and you just look at it and you sign off, yeah, I saw this. Check the boxes, um, and uh, so you you can just check the boxes, or you can make copies of their particular document and attach it to it. But if you make copies for one person, you need to make copies for everyone. You cannot discriminate by choosing to keep documents on some people and not documents on others, okay? And uh, if you ever are audited by um, ICE, uh, then you're going to, uh, that, that's a big deal, okay? And you can be fined for each document that is out of compliance. Yes. So, on the do, should you have an I nine on ten ninety nines as well, employees? No. Okay. You don't need that. Mm -mm. Um, now, on uh, verifying social security numbers, um, you can go to um, the social security and verify social security numbers online, and. Uh, uh, they have this, the Verify website. Um, you wanna verify all of that uh, through the Social Security card and or the site. Um, so is that supposed to be like part of my hiring practices? Yes. To, check, to yes. actually verify? Yes. I yes. thought you couldn't just go <coughs> from the card because people get cards from other people. Right, and that, that's why you have to verify. Okay. Like. Um, you, you know, you ask for the card, you want to see it, okay? Uh, because on the I-9, you can check the box. Either they have to show you a Social Security card uh, and a state ID, and you have the, the different sections, the Section A or Section B of documents, and, uh, or, you know, a passport is uh, good enough. But then after you see that, that's when you go uh, and verify it, okay? Okay. The individual tax identification numbers, these are not social security numbers, and these are not um, uh, sufficient for employment purposes. All right, and typically they begin in a nine and have a seven or eight in the middle number. Uh, these are identification numbers that are given out to people to, you know, uh, if they need to, you know, do certain things. Uh, get, uh, you know, bank accounts or some type of identifying number. Uh, it's just um, for people to have an identifying number who are not eligible for a Social Security number. And they are, again, they are not valid for employment. Uh, those are the due dates for W-2s, your employees. Um, and uh, you have your uh, new hire registry. Most states have a new hire registry where you uh, enter the information on the new hire registry. And then, of course, if they have outstanding child support or whatever, um, they're going to contact you to, to uh, 
withhold that amount and send it over. Uh, you can electronically file your W-2s. Um, and if you have 250 or more employees, you're required to use electronic filing. Okay. Yes. The new hire registry, is there a location you go for that? Uh, as far as the, uh, the state of Oklahoma, yes, the state of Oklahoma, um, actually, yeah, OESC, um, that, I, you know, I know they use, that's for unemployment uh, claims and whatnot, but do they also have the new hire that's registry? Yeah, the new hire. Okay. And you're supposed to do it within 20 days after okay. your employees. You're supposed to go on that website and you just fill out a few boxes. It's really easy, but within a 20 days of filing OESC.com or .gov? I believe it's .gov. You just put in that. Yeah, Google yeah, it'll Google it. It'll Pop right up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and now, uh, and also, when you do have a, a, a independent contractor, you still have uh, to file your 1099 miscellaneous, uh, and this is for services over $600. If they provided services for less than $600, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but. Uh, and, and that's another reason why, you know, you have your independent contractor contract and in that, you know, you want to have, uh, you want to get their tax identification number and their address so that you can properly fill out your 1099. Because say you paid a contractor uh, $10,000 and you have that on your expenses and, it, and you get audited and you don't have a 1099 for that particular contractor, the auditor may disallow that particular expense. So. Uh, that's a, another uh, consequence uh, for not filing a 1099. Um, and uh, you can do that uh, electronically, but again, if you have more than uh, 250 contractors, uh, you have to do it electronically. Um, and uh, you can make corrections on it. Uh, well, I'm going to skip this about choosing a, a paid tax preparer. Um, they're just, uh, you know, this was made before uh, there was a lot of um, new regulations that have come out uh, on tax preparers. Um, you did not have to be a CPA. CPAs and, and attorneys uh, are governed by professional rules of conduct. We have to meet certain requirements and guidelines. Uh, and this was long before uh, tax preparers. Before uh, last year, anyone could be a tax preparer. You just needed a computer and uh, you can sign up. And so you had a lot of unscrupulous uh, things going on and which have been uh, attempted to clean up uh, in the past year or so. So now tax preparers, they do have to pass an exam and uh, pay into a, um, a, to actually get a license in their, in, in, in their track now. So, um, but there are still some out there who, you know, uh, preparers that claim they can obtain uh, larger refunds than other preparers. I know H&R Block does this all the time, but somehow they get away with it. Uh, and, uh, and then if they, their fees are based on the amount of refund that they can get from you, um, you know, that, that is not, uh, on the, that, that, that is pretty unscrupulous because it causes, as CPAs, we can't, we can't do that at all because it impairs your independence and judgment um, to you know, do things to get a person a higher refund and maybe they don't, they don't deserve it. Uh, Does the IRS have a website or something where you can go check and see if the person you're going to is licensed or? Yes. They do. I mean, that's, that's, that's brand new. Um, uh, the, uh, the paid preparers are now uh, registered with the IRS, uh, and you can check that out. It's, again, on irs.gov. Uh, they don't have any reviews or anything like that, but um, you can check to see if, if your uh, preparer is registered. And they, they should have a, um, it's called a, every preparer should have a PTIN number. Uh, it's a prepare tax identification number. And uh, if they do have that number, uh, you could ask them for it. And, um, and, and it should be on the bottom of your tax return when they prepare it. Um, 
Again, this is in your materials about the choosing a paid tax rep preparer. Um, and these important dates are in there also. Uh, oh, you can't, can't see it? Okay, and, and there it is, 1065, April 17th. Okay, I said, I said 315 earlier, but it's uh, the 1065 is uh, April, it's due in April. Um, okay. Is that something that's in one of the books or out on the website? Yes, yeah, so you can get on, a, it's, it's right here, the, the taxgov.calendar. Uh, you have your, all your important dates right there. It's, it's really nice. They have like this calendar and you can choose the different, um, what you want to look at. And uh, it has all the dates uh, throughout the year. Um, you know, you have your quarterly uh, due dates. Um, you know, dates when, when you know, where, where, when you were supposed to file an extension, when things are due, things like that. Um, we have one more uh, we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, home office deductions. Uh, I know that uh, applies to uh, some people, and um, it's a it's pretty it's it's a pretty strict um, issue there. And there's you know there's a, a lot of different rules that govern. Uh, the home office de deduction, excuse me. <clears throat> yes. Is there the Oklahoma or the requirement to send in 1099s to Oklahoma? The okay. Or okay, the question was is there a requirement to send 1099s into Oklahoma? And uh, no, there isn't. Uh, 1099s are uh, for, uh, they're, they're a federal form, and uh, what it does is. Uh, once it's on file with the federal government uh, and say uh, you filed a 1099 on a person and they didn't file any, a tax return or they filed less than what you said you, you paid them, of course the IRS is going to send them a, uh, a notice saying that, hey, you know, we have a discrepancy here. We need to talk about it. If you don't talk to them, they're going to send you another letter saying we have assessed tax on it. We need to talk about it. If you don't respond, uh, once that amount changes, it goes down from the from the from the feds back down to the state, uh, saying that you know we we've audited this person, and then then the state will take a look at it. So they don't have their own form. No. Yes, ma'am. Just um, before we get into the next section, when you have an employee file, let's you have a, a regular employee and a 1099. In your professional opinion, what form should an employer keep in a personnel file to make sure that they've got everything that maybe an auditor wants to see in that file? You know, if it's, if it's employee, do you have a list of files? If you have a W-2 employee that should be, documents that should be in that file, if it's a 1099 contractor, is there a list of files that we should keep in our, you know, in our office on that person? Okay, thank you. Uh, the question was, is there a, a checklist of uh, documents to keep for a, a person who is an employee and uh, a checklist of documents for an independent contractor? Um, uh, yes, there is in the, in the, in the, different, in the publications uh, for uh, the employer and, uh, and you, you have a, a checklist of items that should be there um, and then on um, uh, you can go to, I'm trying to think of a free one, on uh, the, the E-Verify um, website, there is a checklist of documents and a whole step-by-step uh, -step process when you're uh, to do the intake of an employee and the things that you should keep, okay? Um, and uh, there is now, you know, off, off the top of my head, um, of course, from an employee, as an employer, I would definitely have uh, an employment application, uh, and I would ha I would also, you know, have my interview notes, 
I would have a, um, of course, the I-9 and the W-4. And, uh, and then when you have a, after you've done your I-9, um, I would have, when I went through the E-Verify website and verified them, I would go ahead and print that out and keep it. And so those are the basic things that I would have for an employee, uh, for an independent contractor. Uh, I would definitely have uh, my contract with the independent contractor uh, specifying what, what they were to do. Uh, I would have some, uh, an identifying, uh, I forget what the form is called, but there is a form that you can uh, keep for an independent contractor. I would have their uh, tax identification number, name, address, uh, and, and that would be the same person I paid my checks to, okay? Don't let them give you uh, one uh, identification number and name and address and then your checks are going to someone else. Don't do that. W-9, okay. Whatever they put on there is what mm -hmm. the checks are made out to. Okay. And so um, those are some basic things, but um, I, there, I, I'm sure there's some good checklists that you can find, you know, on the internet, on you know, Google it, um, that may have some other things in there, and they may may even have um, some pre-printed, you know, forms for you. Um, the, you know, there's different software packages. There's plenty of things that you can pay for, but you know, there's some there's some free stuff out there also for that. Okay, you're welcome. All right, um, now, now um, <clears throat> the home office deduction is, uh, again, it's, it's a pretty um, strict uh, process. Uh, you have to qualify for the deduction uh, and uh, to qualify to deduct your expenses related to a business use or part of your home. Uh, you're going to have to meet certain specific requirements. Uh, and even then, the deduction may be limited uh, because it's, it's based on uh, the portion of your home that you use for business because, you know, um, the IRS knows that, I mean, this is your home. You get some personal use out of it, so you can't use all of your personal expenses as business expenses. So there are different ways to... Um, to uh, divide up those different expenses. And, um, uh, and to qualify the uh, certain area of your home that you use for the business, it must be uh, exclusive, you must use it regularly, and it must be used for your business. And the business part of your home uh, must be one of the following. It must be your principal place of business or a place of business uh, that you use in a normal course of your business. It can be a separate structure attached to your home that you use in connection with your business. So um, first we're going to look at the exclusive use test. And the exclusive use test is an area, uh, of course, used for the business only. It's going to be a room or a separately identified space. Now, um, when you have a, uh, a room and it's not exclusively used for the business purpose. If it's used for, you know, a personal purpose also, like, like say a lot of people have a little office where they have a computer, but uh, I mean, if, if the kids can come in there and watch TV or play on a computer and do different things, um, technically that's not exclusive for business use. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're using it for personal purposes. And, um, you know, I would just advise, I mean, if you ever receive a home visit from an auditor and you're saying a particular office is for uh, only for business use, you make sure you go in there and you remove any toy, anything that could be <laughs> used or said that this is a, a personal space, okay? And, uh, and it has to be exclusive uh, for your business, okay? Um, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, yeah. Um, 
now. And, uh, and you know, the space, it doesn't necessarily have to be marked off either. I mean, say you have an open floor plan or something, I mean, it could still be, um, you know, designated. You could, you know, say this particular desk or this particular area is designated for personal space, for uh, not for personal, but for uh, business use. And again, it does not qualify if you use both for personal and business, okay? Uh, for example, uh, uh, this fiction, fictional character, say she uses uh, her family room to write legal briefs and prepare uh, client tax returns. She's an attorney. Uh, if she uses, uh, if she, um, since she does not use the family room exclusively for her profession, she can't claim a business deduction for its, for, um, its use. Uh, there are exceptions to the uh, exclusive use tests. Um, if you use part of your home for storage of inventory, product samples, or a daycare facility. And that's a big deal because, uh, you know, a, a daycare facility, of course, you're going to have to, the kids are going to be everywhere. Uh, they have to use the bathroom. You have to use the kitchen to prepare food for the kids and whatnot. Uh, so, um, that's an exception for exclusive use. And there are some other calculations that are used, like, you know, like the number of hours your daycare is open uh, to determine the percentage that you get to deduct uh, for business uh, expenses. Okay, uh, the next test is pretty basic. It's called the regular use test. And to qualify under the regular use test, you must use a specific area of your home uh, for a business on a continuing basis. Um, it, you know, can't be, you know, just sporadic use. Um, and it, it just, you know, can't be sporadic, occasional, or incidental. Uh, and even if you don't use it for any other purpose, it has to be uh, a continuing uh, business use. And that's all that's about, uh, to tell about the regular use test. Um, uh, the next test is the principal place of business test. Um, did it go too far? Okay. Uh, the principal place of business test is um, used exclusively and regularly for administrative or management activities. Okay. Uh, you do not meet the test uh, if, let's see, let me scratch that. Okay. Um, when we were talking earlier about um, a contractor or an employee that could be in a different place, um, that's an exception to this principal place of business test. Uh, you can have an employee um, that works somewhere else and you can still use your home office as a deduction. Your employees don't have to come to your house or you know, be in your home doing certain things uh, to be classified as an employee again. So, um, so you, can, you, know, you still can have your principal place of business even if you have other places of business uh, also. So, uh, and um, a, a yes. So if somebody has an office, like a per se office, office, but then goes home and has an area that they do some stuff at home mm -hmm. and keep some documents and stuff like that. Can they extend both in the office and their part of the home? Yes. Okay, because yes. I thought if you already have that one, the regular office, you cannot do it expensive no. house. Well, business. again, like, like this particular test, like again, uh, if, if that portion of your home is exclusively used for business and, um, and you, you use it continuously and regularly, and then uh, say you're coming home and you're doing managerial administrative activities, uh, say, for instance, I mean, you, say, for instance, you have a, uh, you're a mechanic and you have a garage where you work on cars, where you do all your bookkeeping and everything at home. Well, 
that's an administrative or managerial activity, so you're going to have, you know, both expenses. Um, but what you don't want to do on, on your actual tax return, you have to separate them. Um, uh, on your Schedule C, um, you're going to have certain expenses that are on your Schedule C, you know, that are exclusive to, you know, the outside office or outside place of uh, business. But then you have your other form where you have your um, actual home deductions and those particular expenses you know it has two columns one are going to be direct expenses they're indirect expenses and then uh, there's a percentage that is used to say well this particular percentage is for um, the percentage of your mortgage interest insurance utilities and whatnot are going to uh, go as a business expense and then it it'll flow over to your, um, to your uh, Schedule C also. But you don't want to mix those two up. That's a big, uh, big no-no. And um, so you can do that. Um, again, these are other administrative or managerial activities. Um, this is uh, your principal place of business test. Um, And sometimes uh, you may qualify as a principal place of business if it's a, a meeting place for customers. Um, it may qualify if you, you know, deal with patients, clients, or customers in your home for the normal co course of your business, uh, even though you carry out the business at a different location. Uh, this is the, the separate structure again, what I was talking about, like for a garage or something. You could have a separate structure test. Uh, you can deduct expenses for a separate freestanding structure, uh, such as a studio, garage, or storage shed. Uh, the structure does not have to be your principal place of business or a place where you meet patients, clients, or customers. Okay. Um, Let's get into the, uh, the business percentage. Uh, there are different methods uh, because again, your home, of course it's personal, but if you're using part of it for your business, you can only use part of it uh, as a business deduction. So the typical method is the square footage method. Say, uh, you know, for instance, you have a, to keep the math easy, you have a thousand square foot house, you use 250 feet, square feet for your home office expense, that's 25%. So um, your indirect expenses are going to get 25% uh, of, uh, are going to be 25% deductible. So if your mortgage interest that you paid um, is $10,000 over the course of a year, then uh, 2500 of it would be deductible as a business expense. Um, again, same thing we just talked about, area used by a business divided by the total area of your home uh, gives you your percentage. Um, here's an example uh, that we kind of just talked about. Uh, there's another, the number of rooms uh, method. Uh, this is rarely used, but if, if all the rooms in your house are like the same exact size, then you can um, use the number of rooms method, but it's, it's almost just similar as the, uh, the square footage or the area method. And um, again, here's, here's just an example um, of the percentage. It goes on that column right over here on uh, the uh, 8829 form. That's the percentage that would be used uh, for your particular business deduction. Uh, the type of expenses, uh, you know, for business activities, uh, direct use of the home, uh, you have direct, indirect expenses and unrelated expenses. Not every expense that you, uh, or every dollar that you spend at home is going to be related to your business. And, uh, and but e expenses that are directly related to the particular business are deductible in full. 
they are not uh, subject to the uh, percentage. Uh, say, for instance, you had to paint uh, your office. And so 100% of that deduction would be deductible to your home office. You don't have to break it down by the percentage used. If you only painted that office or redid the floor or something like that, that would be 100% uh, deductible to your home office. Uh, of course, these are uh, different types of, of expenses you're all familiar with. Um, I don't know where I had that twice in there. Um, again, that's an example of uh, direct expenses that are 100% deductible. Um, painting, repairs, internet service. Um, these are uh, these are going to be uh, expenses that are definitely will probably be subject to uh, the percentage threshold of the portion that you use your house uh, for a home office. Um, there is a limit, of course, there's a limit to everything. Uh, the home business and gross income, you, you can't deduct, uh, you can't, you can't, your home office deduction can't cause you to have a loss. Okay, it stops at the point where uh, your gross income, if your business generated $10,000, the most that you can deduct from your home office expense would be $10,000. You can't, uh, it can't cause you to go into a loss. Um, now, that's, you know, just for your home office expenses, but other ordinary and necessary expenses that go on your Schedule C uh, can cause you to, to, uh, to can create a loss. Uh, again, uh, this is a, another example. Um, it's just going to go through the entire uh, calculation on the, the Form 8829, business expense used for your home. Again, here's the percentage um, that, uh, you know, say it's one, one out of ten rooms is used for the business, that's a 10%. And um, and you have your columns here for direct expenses and indirect expenses. And uh, what happens is uh, the indirect expenses are, you get a total here, it's multiplied by the, by, uh, the, uh, the percentage amount and you get your, uh, you, f you follow the instructions here. Um, and, and typically, you know, the software packages will do this for you in a, in a matter of minutes. But it is important that you know where to put things. Um, and typically, uh, and, and when you, you enter stuff into the software package, you can't just, uh, you know, close your eyes and hit the button. You kind of have to pay attention uh, to the items here, okay, um, and make sure that it makes sense. For instance, not line 13 here, um, it's saying multiply uh, column B by line 7, okay. Um, here, it, uh, you're multiplying this number by line 7 by your percentage amount. And, um, and so, here, I mean, just you just have to pay attention and, and just go through and make sure it makes sense. Um, and again, once you get done with the calculation, um, this amount, when you finally get down to it, um, even though you had, you know, a, a bunch of expenses here, it could end up being a small amount. And this will flow over to your Schedule C as a home uh, a business expense of the use of your home, okay? And then uh, caveat to using your home as a, uh, a home office deduction is that here um, you're, you have a, a depreciation uh, percentage that you're going to have to use. And what happens is, is that, um, what happens is, is that when you get to when you sell your home, typically um, 
$250,000 of the profit in the sale of your home uh, per individual is excludable from taxable income, okay? As long as you live in that house uh, for three out of five years uh, and it's your exclusive principal place of, of, of residence, all right, say your, your house, you know, appreciates, it's worth a lot of money, and you sell it, well, between you and your spouse, you get $250,000 excludable um, exclusion from, from your profit. Well, if you use your home as a, as a business, well, the percentage, uh, the depreciation percentage that you use your home uh, for business, you're going to have to pay tax on that amount of profit, okay, because it was not exclusively a personal. So that's the only uh, downside to using a, um, a home office expense or deduction. Okay, um, this just you know goes through the example a little bit more, um, but I think you, got, you guys get all that the difference between using your um, getting a hundred percent of the deduction versus um, a certain portion. Uh, if, you, if you have any questions, well, I think we're running short on time, so I'm kind of rushing through this a little bit, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free uh, to let me know. Um, again, we just talked about this. Important points to remember is, uh, you know, when you're selling your home, uh, the portion that was deductible uh, is going to be... Uh, taxable when you sell your home for a gain. And what's also important is the record keeping uh, and being able to, to distinguish which expenses were ordinary and necessary to your business, which ones were directly related to your home office, and which ones were indirectly related to your home office. Um, and the summary here, uh, we have, of course, your home office has to qualify for a home office. And again, those were the, the, three, um, the three items, uh, exclusive use, um, uh, continuous use, and uh, your principal place of business will, will qualify you. You have to remember your business percentage, uh, types of expenses, you have limitations, and uh, where to deduct on that particular form that we went through. And again, uh, when selling your home, uh, uh, the deductions are going to come back. Uh, and we have to make sure you keep good record keeping. Okay. Uh, any questions on that? I have two. Yes. Um, because the, the, based on what you were saying up there, the home office deduction can, per se, come back to bite you. Would it be better just to charge your home office a rent? Um, no, um, because, it's, because you have to include, you know, of course you're gonna have to include the rent as income, okay? Um, if you're charging your business uh, rent, then you would have to include the rent as income on, you know, maybe a Schedule E, like you have a rent, rental property or something like that. And, you know, it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna come out the same. I mean, it's, 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 it's not gonna help you. I mean, that's, it's a creative way to try to uh, get around it. But, but overall, I, I, and this is how I look at it. Um, say you ran a business in your house uh, for five years and maybe you stopped or maybe you continue it on or whatever, but then you, you live in the house for, you know, 20 years. I mean, it's not going to be, you know, that big of a deal when it comes down to it. You know, it's the, the percentages are going to be small, but if you use, you know, if you had a business in it the entire 20 years, um, when you get ready to sell, you know that this is going to occur. You're going to have to pay tax on the amount of uh, uh, business use that you used for that home. And so when, you, when you're, uh, and, and it's only based on the gain, okay? When you sell the house, say, you know, you sell the house, you break even or you take a loss, you don't have to worry about that, 
all right? But it's, it's, it's on the gain, on the profit that you make from the house. Say you make, um, you know, $50,000 in profit on your house, then you need to know you got to set aside, you know, more money because you use this house as a business. Uh, you're going to have to pay tax on, um, you know, the depreciation amount that you use for your business. And my other question was, when they say home, are they just talking about the, the brick and mortar walls? Oh, it can be an apartment. It can be... Well, no, uh, I mean, and I know it's going to sound crazy, but it's a serious question. Uh -huh. um, because my dump truck parked in my driveway, mm. and that is where they park. They are there every day. They, they go out, they come back to that location. Mm. Okay. Well, um, and it's had to be specially prepped and asphalt laid so that when he's doing the work on the trucks, mm -hmm. he can fly, it can't just be gravel, mm -hmm. you know, so we've had to put asphalt down and, you know, so he can work on, on, on the trucks there. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think that could qualify because um, under that se separate structure test, um, you know, if, if that particular area is exclusively used uh, for the business and it was, it was prepped uh, for that specific purpose, um, you continuously use it. I mean, when you meet those tests, you know, it could qualify. And, but, but then your percentage, um, the space percentage is going to have to go up. You're not, yeah, you, yeah you, you know, you can't say, you know, you have a, a 5,000 square foot home and then you got you know, 10,000 feet of yard that you're using for, you, you know, it's not going to work. You're going to have to use the entire, you know, um, lot, yeah, the entire lot, and then do it that way so it seems reasonable. Okay, uh, any other questions? Also, that uh, working in house percentage and they pay rent for the usage of the yard. Yeah, you could do that too. Um, you, could, you could pay rent for the percentage of the use of the yard. Um, uh, but again, uh, you know, technically, yeah, you're going to have to show it as income on a on a uh, either another Schedule C or Schedule E for uh, rental income. Okay. If if the use of it was prepared just for that, just for the business, wouldn't the whatever they paid for just that be a direct expense to write off? Yes. Yes. So they could write off that whole amount for whatever they prepared it for. Yes. Um, well. Um, I don't think it would be a direct uh, write-off. It's going to be, you're going to have to capitalize it and depreciate it. Um, and uh, so you'll get a, a certain percentage. You don't get, you know, on cer certain expenses that last longer than one year, um, it's required that you depreciate it. And so it depends on the type of property you use. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, like say for instance you buy a new computer, well, you don't get to write off the entire amount of the new computer in the year you buy it. You have to technically depreciate it over um, the useful life. And there's different schedules that the IRS uses, and they have different categories for useful life. I mean, something may have a five-year useful life. Uh, something may have a seven-year useful life. Uh, typically, uh, property um, and houses and whatnot have a 27.5-year a useful life and you have to divide you know your costs over that amount and then there are depreciation methods you have the 150 percent double declining balance depreciation method you have the sum of the years digits depreciation and it depends on the method that you use and 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 that's why when you get into that you need to go to a professional you know and so um, you know and so but but the, but the point is is that you can't just, you know, items that have uh, large ticket items that uh, have a useful life of over uh, one year, you can't write it all off in, in, in the one year, under, except under specific certain circumstances. Like um, there was a, a deal with SUVs uh, that you could write off up to $25,000 in the first year. Um, I'm not sure if that, if that is still open or not, I'd have to check on that. But certain types of vehicles, um, they had to have a certain weight and whatnot. You could, you could write off the entire amount in that year that you spent it, which was a big deal. And it, you know, a lot of people went out and bought them. 
So, um, yes, sir, you have a question? You said something about you have to capitalize. Uh, if you use that portion of the property exclusively, you have to capitalize that? He also said get a professional. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. no. Say, 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 for instance, like, like we were saying, um, if, if she built something on her property that it was exclusively for the business, like, like laying the asphalt mm -hmm. and everything like that, say it cost her $5,000 to do it, okay? Um, she's not going to be able to write that entire amount off in the year she did it because that asphalt is going to last a certain amount of time. So that $5,000 has to be capitalized. It's basically added to the, oh, okay. to the part of the, added to the value of the property, and then divided uh, over the useful life, and then and then that amount you get to take that deduction each year, the depreciation amount. Okay. So, yeah. Seems more complicated that you need or try to make it more likely it's going to have to be uh, it's going to have to be declared as, as income. <laughs> Uh, say that again for me. <laughs> so it seems that the more complicated you think you need to make it, the more likely it is going to have to be required as an income resource. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, it is. I mean, because because you know, if um, sometimes you know, uh, and and that's why you have to you know talk to people who do this all the time, uh, because you know sometimes you. People think of creative ways to get around something or whatever, and it it ends up causing more problems than it, than it solves. Uh, and then sometimes there there are other simpler ways to do things that uh, makes makes life easy for you. And um, and you know your professional can definitely advise you you know on those uh, different decisions that you have to make. And it's better to do it in the beginning than trying to clean it up you know at the end. <laughs> so. Um, Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you guys for listening to me. Um, uh, I hope I was uh, somewhat of a help. And um, and if you um, you know have any other questions or uh, you know feel free uh, to give me a call. Um, there are you have the taxpayer uh, liaison office. There's a taxpayer advocate out there for uh, free advice and whatnot. Um, but uh, thank you again for listening to me, and I wish you the best of luck in all your business ventures. <laughs>